Market to Market is everywhere you are. Subscribe to Market to Market on YouTube, find us on the PBS video app to stream on demand, and add our three podcasts on your favorite podcasting app. Hey everybody, it's Paul Yeager and welcome into this installment of the MTOM Show podcast. Glad to have you here. We are visiting a topic that never goes out of style. It just might change a little bit in the discussion and that is of mental health. We convened a panel in May of 2020. So we thought in 2021, about a year later, we'd find out, has anything changed? Did we, did we magically cure mental health issues? Are farmers and those in agriculture still dealing with everything? We brought back Adrienne DeSutter. She is from Knox County, Illinois. And she is someone that helped us the last time we had this discussion. So we thought we'd find out what's changed. She's on a farm in Knox County, which is, say, the Galesburg area, if you're familiar with Illinois. So downstate Illinois. And she has still been making presentations, even though she is a new mother again for the third time. We'll start talking about childbirth. I'll make a major mistake, which I can laugh about, I hope. And that's also something we'll talk about a little bit in this discussion. So we know this year has been a year of all kind of years. But in agriculture, we know that it's been a major thing as well. Lots of unforeseen events have happened, but that's also the nature of agriculture as we find out. And just remember, it is okay to ask how someone is doing. In fact, it might be one of the most important things you do. So we'll find out how Adrian DeSutter is doing in this installment of the MTOM Show podcast. And by the way, if you have any feedback, hit me up at market to market at iowapbs.org. Love to hear from you, what you think of the discussions that we've been having, and if you have any topics that you think we should cover. Now, enjoy this episode. I asked you when uh, I communicated the other day, I said, you know, you getting ready for planning a birthday party, or did I already miss it? Was there already a one-year-old birthday party? No, he is 11 months, but will be one at the end of June. So, yeah, that's been a, a major change in the, the year b behind us, that we've got a little one that's now crawling like mad, learning how to stand, and, you know, one more farm buddy around. Well, I, we talked in May of 2020 on our special, and I think we had talked before that, and you're like, okay, I just want to let you know, I am like 10 and a half, 11 months pregnant. I go, whatever, it's fine. You know, what more stress could you have? Uh, yeah, I you probably want? wasn't 10 and a half months pregnant because I think you only go to nine, but yes. Oh, we right, were right, 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 right. I'm thinking about a year. It's been a year ago since we've talked. My gosh, I've been through this twice. Yes. Holy cow. Eight months pregnant, seven and a half. I get the gestation time. You know, I was going to just fly with it, but then I thought people may not, like, think I'm a credible human if I'm going <laughs> to just go along with that. But, <laughs> yes, it has flown by. I was. I remember saying, like, I'll sign up for this, but I may be in the hospital at that point. You never know. <laughs> so did you find that the pregnancy, I mean, what was the delivery like? I mean, because at that time in June, we were starting to come out a little bit on the first wave. Were people allowed to come to the hospital? So it was very interesting. Um, you know, the worst part, I think, of the whole thing was, you know, I wasn't so much worried about getting sick because, you know, the rates of, of, of mortality with COVID were still relatively low, especially for my age, for my children's age. Um, so we weren't so much worried about getting ourselves sick, but we were concerned about having, you know, my kids were going to be watched, my two girls were going to be watched by their grandparents. And so if they're sick, how are we going to have them watched? I'm not going to send my kids with COVID over to my grand, you know, to my mother <laughs> or my mother-in-law or my, you know, so, um, so there was that part of it. And at the time, still in June, um, you, if, if you tested positive as a pregnant woman for COVID, um, when you delivered, then you were expected to separate from your baby so that the baby wouldn't test positive as well because that wasn't something that was carrying over. So anyway, so there was a lot of that type of stuff then of, of who's allowed to see who in that month ahead, you know, because you never know when you're going to go into labor. So, 
So it, yeah, it's just the semantics of the whole thing was tricky, but luckily Drew was able to be there um, for it. But but yeah, no visitors were allowed in other than Drew. So it was a much quieter process than the last couple that we have had. So Well, I was going to say, let's, let's be honest. It is okay sometimes to not have all of the circus come in and see what just happened, right? <laughs> Yes, and my husband was thrilled <laughs> because he definitely likes that, you know, just that private time. And and honestly, you know, I don't mind visitors. I'm kind of a so, more social person. Um, I like to kind of show off the babies at the beginning there and, and get that extra help, you know, for me to 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 recover and whatnot. We've had a couple C sections, so. Um, so I didn't mind though, and, and to be honest, it was really nice to have the bonding time. They always say that 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 those you know first couple of days with the baby in the hospital, you just do a lot of holding and getting to know each other, and that was definitely true. So it was a it was a cool deal. And you have to. There's always the you want to hold. You know, the, I would want to hold your child. I want to hold a baby. You know, there's that. You and as a mother, you would say, no, no, no. Before this is before COVID. You're like, no, 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 you're germs. Wash your hands. Now you had a legitimate reason to not let anybody hold your child. So that was that was good. Yeah, well, you know, I have to tell you, I'm not the biggest germaphobe. I mean, we live on a farm, so <laughs> We, we haven't been as picky in the past about letting yeah. people hold the baby. But yes, this was definitely a time where, you know, we didn't even let our siblings come visit right away because we had to make sure they, you know, we just had to make sure every, everyone was healthy. And, and with a, a little baby, you got to keep them healthy. You got to put them first. So, yeah, politics aside, it was a tricky time. Yeah. What about your mental health? Let's let's start with you. I mean, I know you ask everybody these questions, but uh, you know, postpartum is a is a real thing. And when you're in an area where sometimes people like to go out and socialize with others, you had to do all of that on a screen, via the phone, texting, emailing. How did you handle things? You're really throwing them at me, Paul. <laughs> I'll tell you what, because I haven't I've thought about it myself, how this kind of, you know, this post delivery experience was for me in the last year. Um, but I haven't talked about it out loud a lot. And, and it, it was, um, it was definitely stressful exactly in the things that you're saying that, you know, I have wonderful parents and in-laws here. They're happy to help out. But, um, those first few months, we still weren't able to, to take a lot of breaks. I, I didn't get the mom breaks. You know, we, we weren't able to hire a sitter until just a month ago. That was the first time that we actually have had a sitter into our home. Um, so, you know, again, it's all those semantics. It's all those things. And so, yeah, for me, things um, things got a little hairy. Luckily, I have, you know, that that counselor experience that I am able to constantly be self-talking through, you know, my own mood, try making sure that just as I preach, I'm staying ahead of the game. In fact, um, for the first time in a decade, probably, probably a decade, um, I actually j just now, j tomorrow is my first meeting with my counselor. I have a counselor now for the first time in a decade, personally. Um, no worries, I'm all good. But again, I, I always preach this stay in ahead of the game thing. And so I thought, you know, there's some things that I want to do with myself. Um, I want to be a little bit better in some areas. And so, yeah, so I finally kind of did that seeking help thing that I always tell everyone to do. And I'm really excited to see where it goes. I don't know if you knew that, but you don't actually have to have depression or anxiety or any type of mental health problem or condition to see a therapist. You, you just want to, if you just want to work on yourself, some self-improvement, whatever, they're there. I was at the therapist yesterday, the, uh, hairstylist and we were talking well the I mean it's hairstylist it's yeah, all the same right the same right and uh, Joan and I have known each other for years uh, I've gone to her for years and uh her and I do seriously I mean we do talk about a lot of things and I was just saying that this pandemic fast forwarded a lot of things for people uh, the, the mental health discussion is is one of those that now it seems to be people are talking about all sorts of things. Am I reading the country right or the world right that maybe we're talking about this more than we did, at, say, a year ago? I definitely think we're talking more. Yes, you're seeing more. We're seeing more of that, um, you know, this is okay. You know, you hear the slogan, it's okay not to be okay. 
I'm out, I'm over that slogan. Those are things that <laughs> that's not genuine to me. So, you know, but I mean, I, I genuinely believe it, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, we, we hear more, what I have found really interesting specifically in agriculture, but, but really across the board is that we're starting to see how mental health plays a role in many different facets of our life and in many different parts of our industry. You know, we kind of started off by talking about mental health as if we were just talking about depression and suicide, right? That was the first kind of way that we were okay to express it and say, this is an important thing. Well, now we're starting to see that shift into, you know, everyone has mental health. That's not the same as having depression or anxiety or suicidal thoughts, right? I mean, it's all part of mental health, but but we're seeing that everyone has it. We all have stress. We all have issues. My husband and I just got off the phone with me three minutes before I, I logged on here to tell him about how he was stressed out because he's got a meeting coming up this Saturday. He just started bailing. You know, you've got your certain window with bailing that you, you got to get things done. And now this meeting is right in the middle of it. And, and he's... And, and he even is having a stomach ache because of it right now. So it's been, so, you know, like I said, we're seeing how in all the things that we're doing, whether it's right on the farm, whether I just did a podcast um, with someone in ag law. So we're talking about mental health and all these different facets of agriculture. And I think that's what's really healthy is that we understand it's not just a condition. It's not just a a his or her problem. It's all of our problem. We all have to stay on top of our health, our wellness, and stay on top of, you know, being the person that we want to be and in control. Control? What's that? I mean, that's been out the window this year. You know, I mean, this, I mean, in, in all reality, I mean, before, before COVID, Let's just throw, let's just take that out of the discussion. Agriculture as itself is a stressful occupation. Those associated with agriculture, whether they're in the household, in the community, or in the workplace, it's a stressful situation. Uh, Then you throw in a pandemic where everybody, you mentioned the reactions are different. The politics are different. Your husband, let's let's start with him. Uh, He has to navigate Am I going to that meeting in person or am I doing this virtually? I sure miss the interaction of people, but you know what? I also don't miss the interaction with people. Accurate? Yeah. Yeah. No, exactly. It's, it's all of these questions. And you know, we, when we talk about like parenting, we talk about, especially with mothers and and, and fathers too, I don't want to stereotype, but I know that they talk a lot about mothers having this management in their mind all the time that we're not just focusing on raising the children but we're managing everything and when are their meals and when are diapers changed and how are we if I have to have a zoom meeting today so who's going to watch my kids you know so there's all this management going on and I think that we saw again the rest of the country kind of explode in that management and those decisions and and it's a real thing decision fatigue is a real thing when you're having to constantly weigh your pros and cons about everything you do. It's exhausting. It's totally stressful, you know? And so I think we're getting to the point now, I know in our home with vaccinations and things like that, we're getting to the point where those decisions are becoming a little easier. Um, But as you said, even without COVID, farming and agriculture is full of that type of stuff. And not only full of the decisions, but the decisions based on things that we don't have control over, or we don't know the answers to, you know, we can make educated guesses, but, uh, but there's a lot of that going on. And I think that's one critical reason why we do see farming listed in, in the, you know, one of the highest occupations for stress. Well, where are beans going? Where's corn going? Is it going to go higher? And it, it went a dollar in two days just last week. How do you navigate that? You do a lot of kicking yourself if you're our family, (laughs) but you know, there's that, that's, that's exactly it. I mean, and you have to know those things, um, whether you hire someone to do that, make those decisions for you on a farm or you do it yourself or or between your family members. I mean, it it is, it's tough. And I, I was just asked the question not too long ago, you know, how can farmers be stressed out when, you know, the numbers are as high as they are? How is that even a, you know, they're making all sorts of money, right? And, you know, you all know that that's just not the case. I mean, maybe for some, yes, maybe we're taking that level of stress off the plate a little bit, but like you're saying, I mean, 
we sold a lot of our stuff early. You know, we, we don't know what's going to happen. And it's that uncertainty, I think, that really gives us that butterfly in the stomach feeling all the time. It's just really hard to get away, you know, or get rid of when you're just not sure how things are going to go. You're not sure about the rain. You're not sure, you know, about what your conditions are going to be like. And so it's so hard to, to plan for anything, um, you know, all the time. Well, how do you deal with, I sold too early? Uh, you know, I mean, I've asked analysts this and, you know, some will say, well, you know, do a re-ownership thing. Well, not everybody's comfortable doing that. Not everybody's, everybody's in a position to hire a broker to walk them through that. Mm -hmm. But there is a lot of, oh my gosh, I missed $2 on this bean market, or I missed a dollar on corn. That's a lot of money. And that's a lot of stress that everybody's dealing with. I mean, yeah. I guess, again, I'm not trying to expose everything in your home, but you said that you were dealing with it there. Yeah. How do and, you tell and, someone? Yeah. I mean, I hope my husband doesn't kick me for saying that out loud even, but he's not the only one and don't, and and he's, just, he's not no. alone in that. And, and that's just, and you know, we, everyone's at varying levels of those things. That's just something I've heard come up here. And, and I think, most years in our home, that is one thing that um, that we've done okay at mentally, where we just have accepted that that we're going to do the best we can. You know, I mean, we just you know my husband puts in a lot of research, um, and he has this good mental state in that way. There's a lot of things we're not so great on, <laughs> but but that is one thing that he has said. I know that, you know, these are my odds and I'm going to play it that way. And some years are going to be good and some years are going to be bad. And even within the year, some decisions are going to be good. Some decisions are going to be bad. And that's, that's part of how this goes, you know, and you kind of have to accept that reality. Um, if you're, if you're going to stay sane, you know, in this industry. So it's tricky. I mean, that's, it's, it's lucky that we have come to that conclusion because like I said, there's a lot of things in our home that we have not, you know, had that stability on, but that's one thing that we, uh, you know, we kind of agree on. Yesterday you retweeted something. Um, and I know this is dangerous to go into someone's Twitter timeline, but somebody said, repeat after me, I am still valuable and worthy, even when my calendar is blank, my inbox is empty, and my to-do list is short. Friendly reminder that you don't need an overwhelming workload to justify your importance. That's from Kat. You said then, I have some friends who need to read this. Also me, I need to read this. Why'd you uh, say that? You know, this, this dates way back to when I first quit working uh, as a school counselor and stayed home to raise my children. That for me, that was a very large, oh my gosh, who am I moment, <laughs> you know? I mean, am I just a mom? And, and I'm, you know, just a mom. We know that there's no just when it comes to motherhood and to parenting, but it was an identity crisis to a sense. It was, what am I, what, what are my goals? What is my purpose? You know? And when you don't have those defined, it's really hard to find that value, I think in yourself or to, to figure out how you value yourself, even, um, what to do with your time, you know? Um, luckily our first baby wasn't like the easiest baby in the world. And so, <laughs> so, so mom was an okay title for me. It kept, a, you know, kept me going. Um, but to be honest, when we, when we first started talking about advocating for mental health, it was when we had our, um, we had had our second child already. And, you know, the plates were full, even just at home, being a full-time parent of two little ones, they're 16 months apart. Um, we were dealing with a lot of stress at home anyway, on the farm between families. Um, but, you know, we lost someone to suicide. We lost a family friend to suicide and having a background in counseling and mental health. And then that agriculture background my husband had, um, we just felt compelled. Like we just felt like th there's just not a lot of people probably out there that have this kind of insight, not that we're geniuses by any means. Um, you know, that's one thing I preach. I'm not an expert, but I'm gonna help you become your expert. <laughs> you know, you got to find yourself. So anyway, um, when that happened, we added to our plate and we added to our to-do list. And so it has been a struggle since 2018 for us to figure out, you know, what is my role? What do I say yes to? Do I say yes to interviews? Do I say yes to webinars and presentations and all that stuff? Um, because, because number one is our home and our family. And, and we do, that's another thing I tweet a lot is, you know, we say faith, family, farming, 
you know, what are we doing to prove that? What are we doing to prove that those things are the most valuable? So, so that's kind of where my, uh, my, I think inspiration behind that was, is, you know, we, we do have to decide when, when to say no. And we do have to look into ourselves into, you know, who are we really? Are we just farmers? You know, am I just a mom? Am I, you know, what, what makes me worth anything? And, and I have just, uh, we just talk about it a lot. Our, our worth here is not our bank account. It's not our acreage. It's not our livestock. It is our family. That's who, you know, it's, it's volunteering. It's um, being kind to each other. It's growing a good climate here at home. That's, that's what we're worth. And, and, you know, maybe other people don't agree with that because, you know, I, I think millennial farmer posted something as recently on mine that said, you know, if it's a stranger and I, I'm going to, I'm going to focus their worth on their title or their position, you know, and that's fine. We can do that. That's a reality too. But, but for me, the most important person for me is just who I am as an individual. It doesn't have anything to do with, you know, my productivity and all of these other areas. So, so yeah, it's, it's a hard, hard balance, isn't it? I'm going to ask you about comparative culture in a moment, but I want to go back to something you just said. Are you going to be doing more in-person events or has this pandemic allowed you to open up and deliver uh, and present from where you're sitting right now in a very comfortable position? I don't know if it's comfortable. I told you earlier, I pulled out one of my kids' chairs to because they're downstairs and I'm trying to keep things quiet. So so we'll say half comfortable, but yes, much less frilly, you know, having to worry about flights and having to worry about travel and babysitters and things like that. Um, I It has been really inspiring, to be honest, to see how many people have reached out wanting to have this conversation. Um this was not ever something that I started wanting it to become a job. Um, at this point, I, I think I can call it a job. I'm hired to do things. <laughs> um, it's, it's kind of exciting that way. Um, and it, it is, it's inspiring to see how many people and especially how many organizations, I mean, I've, worked directly with farmers, you know, virtually and in person, a lot of webinars and things like that. Um, but, but I do it all. I can't, I'm, I'm going to North Dakota in a couple, let's see, next month, I think it is going to North Dakota to do something with some women. I'm going to Missouri and uh, next month as well. So, so yeah, I'm thrilled about the in-person opportunities, but it's definitely something that I have to balance, you know, being a, a mom of, of three now. So well, it allowed age to to get added to the kids to allow them to be a little more uh, responsible or self uh, managed, not necessarily having to have all of that help. So that that's a, a good assistance. Okay, let's go back to the other uh, topic that I said I wanted to go back to. When comparative self comparing of how my field looks, oh my corn doesn't look as good as that. Uh, my beans, oh my gosh. How come I only see the great fields or the great parts of the field? And how do I justify my farming existence compared to someone else? Why are you even doing it to begin with? Why is the comparison even there? I mean, I'm going to be practical and say, I don't think that all comparing is bad. You know, I kind of like the idea of comparing in any form of our lives to see, um, you know, to see how what we're doing is different from someone else. You know, it doesn't have to be a good or a bad thing, but I think comparing is okay. But I think the problem is when we compare to the point that then we, we again, place our own worth compared to someone else's based on those things. Uh, You know, we've got some holes in our fields right now that don't, you know, look as pretty or whatever. You know, and again, it, it it's hard because as a farmer, that's your that's on display. That's your work on display for everyone to see. Other farmers, your communities, you know, yourself every day if it's right out your front window like ours. Sometimes, you know, I mean, so it is. It's just constantly eating at you sometimes when you make some type of mistake. But I, but the thing is, you know, again, in every job, in any occupation you have, in any position you have in your life, parenting or grandparenting or at the your church or at coaching, whatever it is that you do, you're never going to be perfect ever. You know, there's never a time where you're not going to make a mistake here and there. Um, And the unique thing about farming is sometimes those mistakes that you make are, are, again, not even really mistakes on your 
in, in within your control. It may, you know, a, 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 something that didn't get planted the right way. Well, you know, you only have so much control over those things. And, and um, I think that's, what's really important is when we, we just have to keep things in perspective, you know, not always the perspective of what does my stuff look like compared to somebody else's, but it, you know, okay. You want to have a day where you look at it and you go, I really suck today. <laughs> that's fine. You know, I didn't do very well at that spot. That's fine. You can beat yourself up for a day. Go have at it. Again, I'm all about being practical and being real. I'm not going to tell you the world is rainbows and butterflies. But like I said earlier, we have to make sure that we're staying in control of our stress. And that means if you are getting to the point where your comparison is every day or you're constantly feeling like you're not as good as other people, that's those senses of hopelessness and the, and feelings of worthlessness that are creeping in that can potentially, you know, get even worse if you don't manage that. You know, that can turn into depression, turn into anxiety and turn into something that um, that takes a little bit more than just some self-talk to get out of. I would say I've really noticed it and maybe it's that whole. Uh, like when you look online and you say, I think I want to go on a trip to this city. And all of a sudden in your social line shows up search items for that city that you've mentioned. But I've been seeing more of the things like you just said of why compare? Why does it matter? I am good enough type of postings. And I'll repost that like Instagram is real good and easy to share on a 24 hour uh, section, the story section. So there'll be some great posts that come through and, you know, an operator will just say, I'm, this is, you know, bull. I, I'm done comparing myself and I feel, I felt a ton better in this last six months of my life. That's, it, that's just it right there is that when you actually are able to do that, when you can say, I'm done comparing or whatever it is that's motivating you, I'm done, you know, with, with the way that I am, I'm feeling too stressed. I'm done working on it on my own. I've got to reach out. Whatever it is that you have made that major decision to do, when you do it, the weight goes, <laughs> you know, I mean, it really does. And that doesn't mean it's gone forever. Of course, you got to continue working on things. But um, but that the weight off your shoulders when you are enough, when you believe you are enough in your, in, on your own as a farmer, as a human, whatever, when you have felt, when you've got that self-esteem and that that feeling of, of being worthwhile. Um, it's a whole different worldview. I mean, you, it's like you're walking, you know, walking down happy street or whatever, <laughs> a little bit <laughs> because it's it, because you don't realize just how much you're weighing yourself down every day when, um, when you're constantly beating yourself up. So free yeah. yourself. <laughs> free yourself. All right. If you had to put a slogan on the year that we've had, have you been able to do that yet? Put a slogan on the year. Or, you know, a title of your presentation when you go to North Dakota or Missouri, wherever you're headed. I mean, the, our analysts always have speeches and they give a title of, you know, the year of the swan. You got <laughs> something for? Man, I don't know. I don't know about the year, but I think, you know, one of the very first, you've probably heard me say it before, one of the very first, um, I guess, taglines that I uh said was back with Tyne Morgan. I think it was in 2019. Maybe it was one of the first times I was on air and I just said, you know, your worth is more than the markets. I feel like that's an appropriate one for market to market. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but um, you know, and that, and that goes for every year. That's, I don't know that this year has been, you know, so much more stress or less stressful. That's this, the thing that we have to remember is that, you know, in 2019, agriculture was ready to start talking about mental health because it was a bad year um, for a lot of farmers. Now across the nation, it wasn't bad for everyone, obviously, but, you know, in general, in um, some of what we saw was bad. 2020 said, like, hold my beverage, right? And, mm -hmm. and here we are in 2021 now. And the thing is what you'll see, whether it's in your social media or your networks, you know, anywhere, some people are having an even worse year now, you know, each year it's, we can't, we can't speak for everyone, but agriculture is always hard. You know, we all have good years and bad years. Some of those are different for some people. You know, it's not just a widespread thing. I mean, we see droughts right now, but we see high prices. So some people are happy, some people aren't, you know, and, and we have to remember that, that just because we had this kind of a tough year or this interesting year, you know, we're always going to have, 
tough years or tough moments. And uh, so it's important for us to really continue this conversation and not pretend that because the markets are a little bit better now that uh, that things are better in agriculture because you never know what your neighbor is, is going through. You know, you never know what stresses and you're, someone's going through in your family and whatnot, um, unless you ask, unless we continue to have the conversation. All right. Well, uh, we, again, like you and I have said before, we could do this for a long time. Not sure how many people are still going to stick with us if we do this for hours six, seven, and eight. But let's uh, let leave me with something here, uh, and it is, uh, I think it's something we talked about last year. The simple question of how you doing has to mean more, and you have to answer it truthfully. Is that still hold? Oh yeah, that that's never going away, Paul. <laughs> That's uh, you know that that genuineness is what it really boils down to is that when you're when you're concerned for someone, um, you you have to get uncomfortable. And I don't remember if I said this last year or not, but it's a story I'll never forget. That when we very first started talking about mental health and agriculture, uh, a friend of mine reached out and and she had lost a family member to suicide, and she said, you know, I get that it's uncomfortable. I get that. You know, it's in. Even as a counselor, I had to ask kids about suicidal thoughts every year, and it's never an easy thing. It's never a good conversation. Um, but you just don't know what type of difference you can make if you reach out. And you just don't know that with that genuineness, not just really, you know, eh, how's it going, but uh, but no, really, you know, how's it going? I, I noticed that you're not at the coffee shop like you normally are. I noticed you're not hanging around the farm to chat like you normally do. Um, when we really show that concern, concern and that care and we follow up, um, you know, I've heard stories, real stories about how that makes a difference. I mean, that's that 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 will never go away. We always have to continue doing that and reaching out and being mm -hmm. proactive so that we are having those tough conversations now and not, you know, in, a, in line at the visitation. Good to catch up. We'll be at the next birthday party, I'm sure. <laughs> Always reason to talk mental health, Paul. You can <laughs> <laughs> hit me up anytime. Well, that's good. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Good to see you. You too. Thank you so much. My thanks to Adrienne DeSutter again for that conversation. Always enlightening. Always good to talk with her. And in fact, I think we talked longer almost after we were done recording. So that's uh, always a good sign uh, when it's healthy to just discuss the world in general with someone that you trust. Thanks again for watching and listening. We'll see you next time here on the MTOM Show Podcast.